buying your first house is one of the biggest decisions a person has to make. And while it turns into a horror story to a lot of people, it usually includes nightmarish contracts, termites, or infiltrations. But not mine. My horror story is unlike anything you've ever heard. It started with me deciding that I was done throwing money away on rent. I had some savings and I was ready to be a homeowner. No tiny apartment, no roommates. Just a nice, quiet place to relax after working crazy hours almost daily. My goal was to live close to work, so I started driving around that neighborhood. Whenever I saw a for sale sign, I browsed the details on my phone, and I contacted the realtor. Or at least I would if those places were affordable. The houses closer to work were insanely expensive, so I started driving randomly and ended up finding a quaint neighborhood where I had never been before. While the houses were still very pricey, like everything in this city, I had a feeling that I could find something interesting there. And I did. After driving around for a couple of hours, I saw a realtor was hanging the for sale sign in front of a house that seemed pretty nice. While it was small for a family, it was the perfect size for a single guy like me. I stopped and started asking all sorts of questions, and he replied with a big smile. You're so lucky the house isn't even listed yet, so you're the first to visit. I'm sure that you'll love it, Mr. Daniels. Everything is in great shape. Come inside, let me show you. The house was indeed in great shape, both inside and outside. It needed minor repairs, but it was stuff like fixing two steps on the stairs or getting a new fence for the backyard. And all the important pieces of the house seemed perfect. And you won't believe the price. The realtor was almost more excited than me as he announced how incredibly cheap the place was. A small fraction of the price that I had expected, and certainly something that I could afford. Why is the price so good? I asked, trying to hold back my excitement. Something had to be wrong, right? The owners need quick money to buy a bigger one, he replied. It seemed reasonable, but still. They could list it for twice the price and it would still be cheap, I remarked. When Lady Luck comes to you, you just accept it, he replied. Not smiling for the first time since our conversation had started. His face then lightened up. I mean, if you really want to pay twice, I won't stop you. Like every realtor, he was pushy and persuasive, but in a friendly way. He assured me that if I didn't make my decision immediately, other people would swarm him to buy it the very next day when it was listed and the competition would make the price go up. Pressing me like that worked. So, by the time that I went to bed that day, I was the owner of a new house. My job as an accountant is demanding, so I didn't have a lot of a chance to enjoy my new place at first, or notice that something strange was going on. Then came Friday night, the first time of a typical week that I could actually relax. Instead of coming home late and immediately going to bed, I decided to enjoy not having to get up early the next day. That night, I took a long shower, had a real meal for a change, and sat on the couch to watch a movie. At exactly midnight, a car stopped in front of my house. I briefly thought that it was kind of odd since the street had been incredibly quiet by night, but then I told myself that it was just one of my neighbors. Except that I heard steps approaching my door, and the distinct noise of an object being left on the porch. It sounded like a pizza box. I hadn't ordered anything and wasn't expecting any deliveries. I was so weirded out by the strange incident that it took me a few seconds before I decided to go check it out. And both to my surprise and relief, there was nothing on the porch. A car I didn't recognize was leaving in the distance but whatever it had dropped off was gone. I looked all around, but I didn't find anything out of the ordinary. No packages, no food. Not even the smell of food. Intrigued, I went back inside and I finished my movie. However, by the time that I woke up the following day, 
whatever happened had entirely left my mind. It was Saturday and I had to take a trip to my parents' place and get some furniture that they wanted me to have. The drive was just a few hours so I could make it back the same day. But they insisted that I stay at least for one night and then that I had lunch with them and why not dinner. I ended up returning no sooner than 11pm on Sunday night. I closed the door behind me, annoyed that it was too late for making noise and disturbing the neighbors so I would have to use tomorrow one of my few days off to unload the furniture. As soon as I took a look at the clock, I realized it was 12am sharp. Once again, the car stops in front of my house. This time, I'm not completely unprepared, and I'm already standing next to the door. I can finally solve this mystery with something mundane and move on, I think. As I unlock the door, I hear the sound of the object being dropped again. But when I open the door and see what's outside two seconds later, nothing's there. A man is running back to the car and it's too dark for me to see his face, so I yell at him, but he ignores me. He's little more than a silhouette. I think he's wearing a cap and that his height is average, and that's all I can make from seeing him for a fraction of a second. The porch is completely empty and this time, it feels incredibly ominous. Whatever was there it disappeared in literally one second. So I decided that for the next day, I'm going to wait for him outside. I won't miss it this time. I spend Monday my day off making minor repairs around the house, installing new furniture and cutting the grass, stuff like that. I try to make some sense of the situation. Could it be a prank by one or more of the neighborhood kids to mess with the newcomer? But it would be a lot of work to consistently execute the prank exactly when my clock hit midnight. Besides, how do they make whatever they drop in front of my house and disappear? And it all happened so quickly and quietly. I'm sure some teenagers pranking their new neighbor would be loudly giggling or being loud somehow. I spent the whole day thinking about the moment that I could confront the delivery guy. I didn't want to be aggressive to the guy, only ask him what the heck is going on to demand that he stopped. It was 11pm when I sat very quietly on the porch, and I spent this last hour kind of rehearsing what I would say. Again, it's 12am sharp, when the car pulls up in front of my house. I barely breathe in expectation. I know the man can see me, and I hope that I don't look either menacing or like a fool. I just want him to understand that whatever he's doing is creepy and that he can't do it anymore. For a few seconds, we fight a mental battle, or at least that's how it felt to me. Like I had cornered the guy and he didn't know what to do. I'm more intrigued than scared, but I'm not very strong so the idea of having to physically fight it makes me sweat bullets. This time, the strange visitor doesn't even leave the car. He just drives away after a few seconds of hesitation. His car is a very common model and has no distinguishing features. I don't know his face. I have no way of finding out who he is and this night has made it very clear that he won't make it easy for me. So I decide to talk to the neighbors. The neighbors are dismissive to say the least. I asked if they had been ordering something near midnight but all of them answered no. My last hope of having a normal explanation was that somehow the guy was delivering something to the wrong house, but it was clear that that wasn't the case. I then asked if they heard a car pulling up every day at midnight and the answer baffled me. They didn't. Not a single one of them heard a relatively loud car entering our quiet street. Come to think about it, I didn't hear the car until it started leaving either. It was clear that they thought I was crazy. Look man, if you think I'm crazy, you just come over and wait for it with me, I told them, getting mixed reactions of scoffs and wariness. Two of my neighbors decided to come over for a whole week, but when other people were around, the car simply didn't show up. They even made snarky comments or openly made fun of me every night. I almost started to believe that I was in fact going crazy. But why of all things was I hallucinating with non-existent pizza and a fleeing car? 
As the older neighbor left on the seventh day, he tapped my shoulder and said, Hey, you wouldn't be the first deranged person to live here. Just make sure to take your meds. With this ominous warning, I was left with no choice but to completely forget it and not let it bother me. I still heard the car and the soft thump of the pizza box every night, but I successfully ignored it for over a week. Maybe I am crazy after all, but my delusion is a minor thing that just goes away on its own after less than a minute, so it's not that bad. Everything was manageable until the day that the delivery guy crossed the line. I went to bed earlier that day because the next day I'd have an important meeting and it was barely past 9 when I turned off the lights and fell asleep right away. But then, in the middle of the night, the terrifying sound of my front door creaking open woke me up abruptly and I could hear steps ascending the stairs. I frantically look around the bedroom, trying to find something to protect myself with. At first, I assumed the intruder is a burglar. But when I noticed that it's 12.05 a.m., there was only one person that this could be. Now, one thing is to do this creepy thing while I'm just relaxing downstairs and I can handle that. But breaking into my house and disturbing my sleep, and during the busiest season of the year, is not something that I will dismiss as a trivial incident. I dash to these stairs quicker than I ever have due to the adrenaline. But by the time that I had reached the bottom... No one else was there anymore. The door was left wide open and the car was starting to flee. No, this time he's not getting away with it. I grab the keys of my car and start chasing the guy. I would probably have more regard for my own safety if I hadn't been abruptly awakened. But at that moment, I only had one thing on my mind. Finding out who this guy was. I didn't care that I was still in pajamas and wearing slippers despite the cold outside or even that I had a big day of work ahead of me. This had become creepy and personal, and I just wanted to find out why. The car was not going so fast, so I quickly close in. I try to see the driver's face on his rearview mirror, but despite his open windows, I can't see anything. It's like he has no reflection. He makes a few random turns on blocks that I don't know, but I manage to keep tailing him. When I think that the guy is cornered, he takes a turn on the street. I didn't notice that it was there, and it took me a moment to realize what had happened, but I wouldn't allow myself to lose him. The street he entered is a narrow one, and it ends on a huge abandoned lot, all surrounded by tall wire fences. I smiled as I realized that he cornered himself and slowed down, but then I noticed that he is not slowing down. As I start yelling that I don't want to hurt him, he throws his car against the fence. I close my eyes and scream in panic, terrified that I have led the guy to either seriously injuring himself or worse. But the sound of the crash never comes. Instead, the fence is intact, and the car is nowhere to be seen. My mind starts processing the images that I saw right before closing my eyes and, unbelievable as it is, I am 100% sure that the guy and his car went through the fence like they weren't physical. It completely disappeared as soon as it crossed to the other side. I don't know which was the worst part. The fact that I saw a whole car behaving like a ghost. Or the fact that I didn't hit the brakes soon enough. And then my car crashed against the fence. The first one was the only thing on my mind. So I barely noticed what had happened to me until the police found me several minutes later. After making sure that I wasn't severely hurt and assuring me that the damages to my car didn't seem to be major, the policeman gave me a huge fine. I tried to explain what I was doing there in pajamas and slippers, but they watched me with pity and concern on their faces when I talked about a home invader that could phase through fences. You're having a rough night, pal. Let us give you a ride home and please rest and take your meds properly, okay? The older and more fatherly policeman put his hand on my shoulder. If you still think you saw a ghost car by tomorrow, please give us a call and we'll do everything to help you. Defeated, I did my best to sleep and focus on working the next day. 
My body was sore, but it was nothing compared to the terror that I felt about the disappearing car. On the very next day, I bought an expensive, high-quality security camera for my front door. I wanted to make sure to catch the intruder's face with detail, to finally identify him and put an end to this madness. Thinking back, I should have done that from the beginning, but despite being unsettled by it, I guess I wasn't taking the issue that seriously before he broke into my house. I was able to see him that same night, and I wish that I hadn't. He approached the door with incredible speed, his joints making nearly inhuman movements. He was indeed holding a pizza box. When he approached my door and leaned to leave the box, I could see him closely. His face was nearly featureless. The cap covered it almost completely, but with that cam, I could perfectly see that he didn't have a mouth like he was wearing a balaclava mask made of skin over his own skin. I was terrified by it, and I didn't want to chase that thing again, but there was a piece of useful information. His shirt had the logo of a pizza place, Pizza Mike's. I tried calling immediately, but they were already closed for the day. I barely slept that night and spent the whole day feeling a horrible uneasiness, like I had stumbled onto something that I shouldn't. By the time that I left work, I decided to go to Pizza Mike's and talk to every employee until the doorbell video made sense. The place wasn't far from my house. It looked completely average and didn't have a lot of customers at the time. I'm being harassed by one of your delivery guys. I told the girl behind the counter, he comes to my house every day at midnight. I'm sorry, sir. Can you please give me your address so I can check? I complied and she typed it on the computer. Oh, we haven't delivered to this place in years, sir. But you have before, I asked. Look, I have a video of the guy wearing a shirt with your logo. Yeah, I can see at least two weekly orders from 2006 to 2015, she replied. I'm not sure I can help you. Can I please see your manager? The manager's face was white and shocked as he asked me to follow him to his office. We entered the small room and he asked me to confirm my address. And you said you have a video of it. I confirmed and handed him my phone after watching it. His lips were trembling and he was doing his best not to cry. The previous owner of that house was a regular here. He explained with a shaken voice. She loved our pepperoni and pineapple pizza. Oh, I muttered, waiting for the rest of the story. That day, there is a new hire in the kitchen, and we messed up her order. She was furious more than it would be reasonable. She remarked that she was incredibly hungry and that we ruined her night. Since she was a loyal client, we assured her that we would send the right pizza ASAP and that the next one would be free too. But apparently it wasn't enough. Did you get her pizza? I asked. Yeah, of course, but it was a busy night and we only had one person delivering at the time. So she had to wait two or three more hours. Her pizza only arrived around midnight. And when it did, she lashed out at the delivery guy insulting him and us. She screamed like someone possessed by a demon. He was a sweet boy named Rashawn. He had some mental issues, but he was very diligent and everyone liked him. His job here was his life, and he was always ready to defend a pizza Mike's like one would defend their mother. So I assume he fought back. He sure did. The manager gave a deep, sad sigh. Eventually, he apologized and said that he had to go and make some more deliveries. But she wasn't done being angry. So she took her car and chased him. I had a vague idea of how this would end. Rashawn was nervous and made a wrong turn, so he ended up crashing against the fence on that empty lot on Washington Street. But she still wasn't done being angry. So she shot him four times. He died, of course. I was shocked. She somehow was able to drive back home, and apparently she didn't like the neighbors either because she shot two more people before realizing what she had done and ending herself. It was supposed to cause a commotion, 
but a relative of hers owns the local newspaper, so it was mostly covered up. We only know what happened because Rashawn had butt dialed us, and we could hear everything. Why did she do this to the neighbors, just because? I asked. Apparently, she couldn't stand loud sounds and they spent many nights outside playing music. After it, she entered her house, leaving the door wide open, and blasted her own head. It was bad. A lot of curious or worried people saw her body before the police showed up. By the end of our conversation, we were both sure that I was reliving over and over the last day of Rashawn's life. Probably the fact that someone was living in that house again and had made his spirits restless. I started planning to call the priest, sell the house that I'd barely bought and then move far away. But the very next day, Rashawn stopped coming, and he never showed up again. I loved the house, so I eventually started to forget about it at all and told myself that tragedies have happened everywhere at some point in the past, and that holding on to it would make my life unnecessarily more complicated. I pray for Rashan's soul and even for the deranged lady, and I'm immensely grateful to whatever made it stop. Other than that, I don't think about it anymore. It was only when I found out about the manager's unexpected passing from unknown causes that I remembered one of the things that he told me. The new hire in the kitchen that day was me.